Okay, if I can get your attention while we're waiting for Mark to come on. I hope he's going to make it. I just had communicated with his assistant Friday, so hopefully didn't, we get that connection going. Um, how many of you have read this particular book? Great. Um, you don't necessarily have to. Some of these things we've actually, I don't know if you remember from, it's been about a year and a half ago, I had played a video of Mark Charles talking about the Doctrine of Discovery from a Revolutionary Love Conference that we had attended. Um, so there's some some familiarity. I know, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, I mean, how many of you have you heard the term Doctrine of Discovery? Yeah, it's pretty, it's finally getting out there to be known, but I know even in 2019, when we went to this conference, he was speaking, he starts talking about stuff, Doctrine of Discovery and how that plays in the Constitution. I'm going, what, what, you know, where, where does it say all of that? Sure enough, he spent a lot of time studying, studying it. I don't know if he'll get to get into a lot of his personal life. He actually lived on the Navajo Reservation for a number of years with his family, which is written about in the book. So they lived out on a Hogan. Uh, no running water, no electricity, out in a mud, muddy, dirted road for, uh, I think it was about three or four years, just because he wanted to reconnect with the Diné people. And that's what the, the Diné call themselves rather than our typical term of the, the Navajo. Um, so he, he spent that time and then came to the conclusion he was also, at, right after that, he was a of the Reformed Church. He was a pastor. Um, so he had a church in Denver as part of the Reformed Church, and that's the tradition that he's from. His grandfather was converted based on the Reformed Church, pulled into the Dene lands, and, and they had a mission there. And his grandfather was converted to Christianity. And then his father um, also then um, into Christianity through the same mission. Uh, both his mom and, and you'll hear about this in the way he described it, both his mom and his grandmother are of European descent. Um, and so both father and grandfather were of Diné. Um, so that's a little bit of background about him. I don't know if you um, read it. For those of you who haven't read it in the book, and it probably won't necessarily come up, you know, he's had some tragic issues in his own family life. Um, including the death of his brother with him being at the at the wheel um, and how that affected his life um, uh, for a number of years going into college again thinking that he was responsible solely for that event and but not being able to grieve that event which is another thing I know there's groups within here talking about the grieving process and what happens when you can't even grieve that process and then all of a sudden, a few years later, it hit him at one particular point and he just had this opening moment. Uh, but then also through that, given the community that was with him, the acceptance of who he was and that he wasn't to be blamed solely for an incident that happened, uh, one of which he doesn't remember from the, from the accident even itself. So um, I listened to Mark, um, he has these, these sessions called uh, um, Second Cup of Coffee, and usually once a week, sometimes not so much if he's on the road traveling and discussing things. He comes on and, and talks about topics that are of contemporary um, issues mostly, um, and I, I love to listen to his perspective on a lot of things. So when he's talking about unsettling truths as the, the title of this book, that's exactly what it becomes. You know, it's not comfortable all the time to hear things, especially hear things that your uh, adoption or your upbringing haven't even brought you to, to comprehend or even come close to it. Um, an example of that, we watched, there's a, a movie called The Forgiven uh, with Desmond Tutu and his work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he's through the process of that, there's a man um, that had witnessed and, and basically allowed people to murder um, some of the, the local uh, black people uh, from their very racist perspective. And he's just breaking down, but 
it was his daughter then that went to Desmond Tutu. She said, I should have known, you know, and I should have seen, but I didn't. And I think that's what Mark kind of helps us clear up a little bit. What are some of the reasons that we don't, that we don't see these things or don't hear these things? Um, and I don't know if it'll come up much today. Um, he talks about a perpetration induced um, stress disorder. And he came across, so there's a book on that by a woman that basically says, you know, just as people who have suffered some kind of traumatic experience can have an individual PSD uh, kind of response, um, and there can be a communal one they've discovered as well. So groups of people can have that being those that um, have received some hurt or harm uh, from an event. Um, but they're, they're showing now that people who are the perpetrators, you, you just have to think those that have been involved in atrocities or even a murder of some sort, what are they carrying around inside of them as well? Um, and his studying that has helped him because he gets responses. Some people are incredulous at what he's saying um, and very hateful responses to the things that, that he's discussing and promoting. Um, and he tried to understand, well, well, why is that? You know, I'm just telling a story, a narrative story, a truth of the people uh, of basically marginalized people uh, and uh, indigenous people of America in particular at this point, um, and why the why the response? And and he's come to understand he has to kind of talk to people in a way to, that under realizes that that we they too are experiencing some kind of a stress um, just because down the line we're also related. We have to take hold of that because other generations and in some essences things that we as a country even done more recently um, we have to hold that um, inside ourselves and and try to understand it and work through it as well so that's helped him to, to in his conversations with with people um, outside of uh, his time together um, hmm I'm going to go ahead and start with some things. I mean, we can always have a discussion anyway, especially those that can have the book, and we can read a few things even uh, describing Doctrine of Discovery from his book. Uh, but I was going to start with our land acknowledgement, because I know if he ever gets on it, that's always the first thing that he does in any talk that he gives. Um, he introduces himself and then uh, recognizes the people of the area that he's, that he's either at or where the land that he is. He's, he lives in Washington, D.C. now um, with his wife and three kids. We, the Agnes Day Lutheran Faith Community, acknowledge that we gather each week on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup people, Shpuyallupops, a Coast Salish Lashootseed speaking people. The Puyallup people have lived along these shores for thousands of years, faithfully stewarding these lands and waters as they continue to do today. The earliest native residents, a branch of the Swiftwater people, the Schwabops, called this land Tlokket, and their longhouse was within walking distance of our church. This land acknowledgement is one step toward engagement and true solidarity with the Puyallup tribe. We commit to uplifting the voices, experiences, histories, and concerns of the Puyallup and of all indigenous peoples and to being good stewards of the land and water which surround us. I don't know if you get to the, the gateway anybody does that's out on the, the peninsula out there. There's a magazine called, uh, uh, it's not the gateway, it's the peninsula, what's it called? Key Peninsula News. Key Peninsula News. Well, this last one, they had a, an article that had some maps and it maps from 1855-1856 of the Key Peninsula. And lo and behold, probably the Squaxin people uh, had a village creek um, within a mile of our place. So the Squaxin used that area. So as well as the Puyallup people in this general area move out that direction, the Squaxin off of Squaxin Island had come in and had uh, little fishing areas and villages and the like too. So I found that interesting. I might have to, for my own, I have to include the Squaxin people uh, on people of this land um, where, we, where I stand. Let me go into, uh, again, 
I've listened to him and talked to him personally a number of times. I've had four, even a, a sermon he gave down at a, a Great Spirit United Methodist Church um, down in Portland, um, an indigenous urban church, which is a fantastic uh, community of, of faith and using the traditions of indigenous people. So there's drumming um, as part of the music and um, it's it's just a, a wonderful experience and some of their liturgical expressions within there are pretty uh, dramatic as well um, and dynamic one of them is the very end their doxology is the tune of the dakota 38 they were singing as they were going to the gallows um and that is the end of their expression of being with creator, having been with creator, and continuing to be with creator. But this is the song that they sang as they were going to the gallows. And it's just kind of, oh, <laughs> blows you away that that's an expression of their faith and understanding um, of their own lives. The pastor down there is of the Cherokee Nation. Um, Buck's his last name. Um, so we've got a bigger, bigger area of people. The, the doctrine of discovery. Basically, the, the there were some papal bulls. So basically, the uh, the, the Pope back in the 15th century um, made these pronouncements, what they call bulls, um, to talk about how mm -hmm. European settlers could carry on in other lands outside of Europe. Was basically the extent of it. So the first two in 1452 and 1454 went to the Portuguese. Um, and basically said that if you go to a land that is inhabited by non-Christians, and, and mostly there was the term for the Muslims at the time, so Muslims or anybody that wasn't Christian, you had the authority to subdue them and the lands that they were on. So this was a pronouncement in 1452. 1454 then, they, they continued it in another bull which not only said that you can subdue them, but said you can dominate them. You can put them into perpetual slavery. Anything that's on the land or is there is yours. And it's a gift of God um, for you to take uh, because we as Christians are, are called to spread the news and to, to convert uh, people to Christianity. So these are papal bulls of 1452 and 1454. So here you get... Christopher Columbus traveling the world in 1491 and um, landing upon um, lands, um, which all well, of Mark Charles' expression, he basically was lost at sea. <laughs> um, but they had, to, they had to rationalize the fact that he was there and brought back some slaves. So that was 1491. So the next papal bull was 1492 that gave the authority for him this was a papal bull specifically expressed towards the Spanish to do the same, to dominate, subdue, and they even divided because they didn't want to have European wars going on about this. They divided so Portugal would take the African coast, uh, West Coast, and uh, Spain and the Spaniards would take the Americas. Um, so that bull basically said the same thing. You can dominate. You can do whatever you takes um, to, to control that land. So it, here is, an, so we have people coming in through, given the rights by the, and, and that was a question I was going to ask him, um, definitely by the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And kind of my question was at that point, well, you had the Reformation not too many years after that. Did the Reformation ever put up a stance against such? Um, given that um, the English church um, and the Puritans both latched onto it in their approach of uh, North America, I, I would say they probably latched on to the, the same idea of uh, take the lands, they are your lands. And the doctrine of discovery basically then is used as an international law for land titles. And the last time that it was referenced in the United States Supreme Court was just in 2015 and basically said that the, the laws of the land are governed by the doctrine of discovery, using that term itself. 
um, within the United States. Basically how the situation was, there was a tribal group in New York. And again, the East Coast was pushed aside of indigenous people the earliest on. And they wanted to come back and have, have the land on their land area. So Long Island basically is where, where they had lived previously. So they came back and bought land on the mark for market price. They bought land that they could come back and basically use as a, a reserve reservation area for themselves. What they were seeking was to have that land be considered reservation land and not the government or United States land in, in particular. And the United States Supreme Court said, nope, it's been too long, you lost your rights. Um, so you, you do not, you cannot claim that as sovereign land again, because um, it would disrupt, that's kind of the terminology. And uh, Ruth Ginsburg was the one that wrote that, uh, that, uh, the report basically from from that uh, case so it's been referenced as of late um and continues then so when you look at it, it's just something to think for later when you look at land titles and our our ability to own a spot of land here at the church at our own homes is relative to papal bulls in the 15th century uh declaring that we have we have the right to it uh, because we are part of a christian uh christian nation so those are the 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 the, the, grant, the beginnings of an understanding of uh, the doctrine of discovery and how they they would play a role for us. Um, and and then he goes further back to say, well, well, how where did this thinking come from? Where did where did the Roman Catholic Church think that it was right for them to take over other lands? And he, he carries it back as far as uh, Constantine um, and actually uses some, some phrases by some theologians at the time that rather than referring to Christ even within their statements, they referred to Constantine. So where it would look like we devotion and, and who we should be looking towards for guidance, it wasn't Jesus the Christ. It was Constantine. So there was already a, a switch into uh, what he calls a Christian exceptionalism. And we have a sense that as Christians, we're exceptional. And that led to empirical types of ways of living. So like the doctrine of discovery and following through with that. So he's going back a long time to say this was this was probably a beginning i was going to ask him that today it was still a little sometime is whether he thought maybe that even would have occurred previous to that but but the basis of that is uh, there's a we think we're kind of exceptional and that we have certain and especially in terms of um covenants and land so he equates that again to the jewish people and coming back and returning to to their land um, in the middle east and and the jewish people had a covenantal relationship that's what he's talking to with god so their covenants said god uh, was having a place set aside a place a place that they belonged and should have and and christianity has kind of taken that and use that um, to, to expand into the United States, basically. Uh, manifest destiny, that whole term was kind of that same sense of American exceptionalism or Christian exceptionalism, that God has set this Mather Cotton when he was given a speech in 1630 on the boat into uh, the Northeast saying, God, this is, God has delivered us across the sea, uh, quoting scripture or the scripture says across the river uh, used across the sea. It was all set up to, to spread the word, to take over the lands and, and make them right um, in the name of God. So we're continuing to carry forward this uh, Christian except, exceptionalism idea um, and how that continues to show up now. You know, he's trying to look at where, where do we continue to, to see that. Um, some of that is, is listening, reading a book recently called Sand Talk by an aribin, uh, Aboriginal man, Tyson Yunkaporta. Um, and and he, he describes it, it's, it's the notion that I am better than you. Yeah. Um, and truly narcissism. 
you know, to think that I am better and therefore I should be able to do what I want. So, and I'd imagine um, Erie's not um, uh, a Christian, he's not a, probably wouldn't consider himself a religious person, so to speak, other than within his own tribe. I would say he would probably entitle that as sin, the original sin of thinking that you are better than somebody else, at least from his, his standpoint. Um, so we've got we've got people that are trying to understand it, and, and Mark Charles comes from a perspective that's that's different than ours. Um, but first of all, do you guys have any questions off of what we've talked about so far, or what you remember from the book? And maybe we can. I just have a comment about what we're talking about. Um, I'm reading this book called uh, Land of Hope and Fear. It's about the history of Israel. And it's really interesting because they have the same racial problems there that we do because the original Jewish settlers who came, some of the earliest 1910, were white European Jews. And then in the 50s, after they established the nation, in the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of uh, what are called the Shep Shepardi, Shepardi Jews, which came out of Arab countries, and they tended to be brown skinned. And the white Ashkenazi Jews were prejudiced against the brown Jews, even though they all share the same DNA. It just had to do with the color of skin. And now it's happening again because in the 90s, they had Russian Jews and Ethiopian Jews and Moroccan Jews, and they're all being prejudiced against by the white and the light brown Jews. So it, it just the thing about the narcissism that we're better mm -hmm. based on the color of skin isn't just the US, it's all over. And as Mark describes, there's a, an indigenous group even within there outside of the Palestinian and Jewish community, communities called the Bedouin. Um, and they too have the same experience of indigenous, indigenous people in the United States. And they are being left out of any conversations going on as well at this point. But even he, he discusses, basically, I don't know if you remember, back in 2015, Netanyahu came and addressed both uh, houses of Congress and what his speech said was that Israel and the United States have something in common. We have promised lands. And, and he knew that that would work in the United States because that was the assumption that was gonna be held that yes, this is our promised land. This is our land to, to hold upon. And he knew that he could use that speech um, to, to connect, um, connect with people in the United States. Any other comments or questions to start with? How do you feel about that term Christian exceptionalism? Because basically we're Christians. You know, do we do we really have that? Do we show that? Or do you feel like we show that? Or if not, are we just not a part of that? Tell us. I have a problem with the word Christian, but with that word, because um, it seems like that's an oxymoron. That is not Christian, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, that's not, I'm sure how other people feel about it. Some people who feel that um, they can define Christian and it can make, be exclusive, it can be harmful, hurtful, and um, uh, can be a reason for, for example, right now, Christian nationalism. So, uh, I reacted strongly to uh, being called it being called Christian, especially so I think that's a misnomer. Yeah. I just want to say I agree with you, Phyllis, but I think that many of us were raised with that, not using the word exceptionalism, but you know, um, I'm a good Christian, meaning I'm a patriotic American, um, and and that it just got kind of in our DNA, probably not even realizing we were doing that. And a little bit like Pastor Tom's sermon this morning, sometimes it's important to remember where you've been and acknowledge 
not just the good that you've gone wrong. And I think maybe it is an oxymoron. Maybe Christian and exceptionalism shouldn't go together, but maybe it um, becomes an unsettling truth that you have to grapple with. And that's exactly what he's trying to, to say about that whole, even our um, movement within the ELCA on the Truth and Healing Commission. It's that whole aspect. Healing comes because we start to deal with the truths that are out there. And another thing that he'll promote then from the Christian to exceptionalism part is really he sees the Jesus incident uh, in, in, in corporation into the world basically as a relationship. And that's how Jesus saw it. It's not a land relationship. It's not necessarily a covenant relationship, but it is a full relationship and how Jesus lived out his life and who Jesus lived out his life with, typically. Um, I'm thinking of, okay, so we, we were highly conservative and evangelical for way too long. <laughs> and so I think Christian is, um, exceptionalism, I'm like, oh, that, that is a very accurate term. But, and it reminds me of when I finally understood what cognitive dissonance was, which was a huge piece of being able to leave the evangelical movement behind. And so I'm kind of like, oh, I, I like that term because it speaks the truth that a lot of Christians don't want to believe because as much as you're on the liberal side, there's still a huge population out there that very much believes Christian exceptionalism, even though they have labeled it. Mm -hmm. It certainly flies in the face of uh, any humility. So when I was in sixth grade, we got to go to Minneapolis and see Cinerama. How the West was one. Oh, you remember that? And when you were talking about this, that song, We've Come to the Promised Land, um, it, I mean, I was in sixth grade. I believed all of it. So I think you really kind of nailed it when you said that the early papal decisions were following Constantine, not Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think there's still a lot of people in this country that believe Jesus was white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'll find actually that the person that heads up the ELCA's Truth and Healing Commission, Lance Black Fox, again, he, he, somebody asked him, why do you stay Christian? You know, as an indigenous person, why are you there? And why specifically are you a part of the ELCA? And to him, A, number one was the, the idea of grace. Um, and the second aspect is he sees Jesus as an indigenous person and can relate to Jesus as an indigenous person. Hey, did you have a class once or somebody was telling about Constantine that that really was political? And it was um, tied Christianity to politics, which then is money and power. Yes. And, and that's, that's what really got us in control. Here's a, just a quote from his book. It says, this book therefore offers a lament over dysfunctional theology and a broken history kept hidden stories of oppressed people. Um, he often talks about laments, and I actually asked him in a Q&A session the other night, so how do you equate um, lament and, um, in, into this, to this process? And he's really talking about, again, looking at the unsettling uh, truths um, creates a, a new way of looking at things. And once you know those, you have to start with the truths to get to an understanding of what you should be lamenting rather than oftentimes we want to rush to reconciliation or as he likes to refer to it as conciliation because he doesn't feel like there ever was a relationship to begin with to bring back together but just trying to to create that relationship so a, a truth and conciliation a process within the, the united states 
um, which again, some aspects of that are beginning studying uh, um, board uh, schools um, that were set up, a lot of them by Christian faiths. Um, and that's one of those that was talked about in the ELCA's site, uh, one in Minnesota, where they have a recognition of uh, a boarding school that the, 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 the Lutheran church at the time had, had held. Um, so part of that healing, again, is understanding the truths of those events, uh, boarding school events. Um, so I think there's a movement to try to understand it more fully. Um, within at least certain elements of both the ELCA and the broader Christian church. Um, and, and that's good to see. And I think he, I, I think he finds that supporting too. He loves to get these kind of conversations because that helps build him to, to carry on too, to say, and not lose hope, <laughs> a sense of hope as to uh, what might change. So he's looking for relationships to build, you know, with, with all people. So he was had his own independent uh, presidential campaign in 2020, and it was for all the people. That was his. So using the Constitution, if you want to know something that knows the Constitution, you know, it's we the people. And then it goes on to tell you, well, who, what people aren't included. And frankly, that's going to include at least 50 percent of the people in here who weren't even included in the Constitution. And he's saying, but those words are still there. You know, there's all, it's all uh, male uh, pronouns. So women weren't included in this. African-Americans were considered three fourths of a human and, and that still didn't give them the right to vote. Um, and Native Americans were excluded 100%. So that's still word wise. And that's the kind of things he's bringing up, you know, talking about these, oh, our constitution doesn't say that. Sure enough, that's what it says. So he was just looking at his, from his standpoint, was let's just change some terms. <laughs> let's, let's include everybody in our constitution um, and operate off of that. African-American men even got a vote before women. If, if they were given the chance even to get to the polls, yeah. so that, was, yeah. that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just makes me think of the term tribalism. Since ancient times, you know, a tribe is a source of security, safety, is a way to survive. And here we are in these modern times, and we have such a sense of tribalism here in all these things we've talked about when people gather together to protect. And in the United States today, we are struggling with these tribes. And I'm starting to see from your talk too that as a Christian church, we were our own tribe. You know, we gathered together, we protected, and we identified too. And as Phil has said, that we must rethink that and look at it differently. But we have been um, indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even uh, listening to somebody the other day talk about we've outsourced violence as well for our own comfortable sake. You know, we don't have violence going on all around us here because we basically outsourced that to some form of military police sources. And, and what role do we play in that? Do we like our comfort so much that we're willing to outsource that to somebody to handle it for us? rather than maybe open up those conversations and those relationships that take away that violence to begin with or that violent nature of, of things happening, which typically ends up being people that we've pushed aside and uh, at least marginalized, if not oppressed. So things for us to be thinking about relative to that. In your uh, conversations with him, did he ever uh, indicate what does he think the church should do? Since the church really seems to be at the crux of the problem of spreading this misinformation and this, as he called it, dysfunctional theology. What is he asking? I know one thing that I can remember from the book would be to lament mm -hmm. and to face the unsettling truths. Mm -hmm. So that is a big step, and that's not easily uh, attained either. But 
what else would he want the church leadership uh, to do to um, address all these injustices? The thing that I like so much about Mark is that because I've talked to him personally and thanked him because he's working through those things because he too uh, was cultured in a white perspective. And he is in some ways answering, kind of digging into these same questions, but he's just a step ahead of us. He's working through it. He's trying to work through it. So I think that's the first aspect we have to understand. He's still working on that. He's working on a, um, on a book right now called Decolonizing Faith. Okay, so let's decolonize. Where where is our faith been colonized? Um, and that would be interesting. He just throws little tidbits out once in a while. I just keep listening to, to find out what more uh, he has coming up. But I think we'll get more uh, relative to that. He's also working on, a, there's kind of a, a mutual, within the whole country, there's a reverence of Abraham Lincoln. And he goes and talks about Abraham Lincoln and a lot of where he came from and a lot of his very known statements. Um, and he was basically very racist. Um, some would say, did he make a conversion of some sort as he got later on? Or was it uh, for purposes of just, okay, as you'd said, I want to keep the union together. Um, at the same time that uh, the buildup into the Civil War and afterwards, he's the one that had the Dakota 38 uh, hung. Um, and he was the one that wrote a lot of legislature for the railway lines. Well, Mark Charles goes and points out every one of those railway lines that met up against a large indigenous population, they had some tragedy there or some movement of them out of those lands to allow that. Same with when you had mining operations, fine gold or something like that. Okay, we got to move the indigenous people. And we're still, it's something else we have to wrestle with, and I, I, I do, and that is, you know, we talk about green sources of power, and I'm hoping that on our conversation on the 25th with uh, um, Kevin Jones, Kevin O'Brien coming to talk about climate justice, um, that we get into that, where are we getting the, the materials to be able to build these things that we call part of the green, uh, uh, green revolution, so to speak. Um, it's typically from native lands, you know, we're again taking things from uh, and moving them again or polluting their water sources or polluting their lands because we found something valuable. So is that really the solution? You know, what is the solution? I mean, these are tough questions to deal with. Maybe it's overconsumption and not necessarily why are we always trying to find more ways to, to build power sources? So I think he'll come into a lot more thinking like that. And the people that he hosts, um, uh, there's a woman, uh, Sarah Augustine, didn't bring her book. So our children can live. Um, she lives on the Yakima reservation right now. She's not of the Yakima nation, but she moved there about 20 years ago. And she's talking about beyond what we're talking about of just providing power that's uh, more green power. Um, and and we need to do that so that our children have a place to live that's that's tolerable um, and they can survive. I mean, I don't know if you saw in the paper, I think it was a, uh, a TNT this week that showed the label of 16 cities, even in Washington state, that basically are uh, affected tremendously by um, pollution you know, of some sort, air, water, the like, and are in somewhat dire straits. So there's lots of questions that'll come out um, from that. And Mark's kind of on the forefront of pushing that, at least from a, especially from a faith perspective, as he's, he's wrestled through um, his faith. Sorry, couldn't come because I really like Mark. I really like I like how he interacts. Sometimes you read just this book, you know, there's a lot of heady stuff, and you know, it takes a process of going through, and it's a lot of information that's in here. And it's like, okay, what's that? But when he talks, or even his own description of who he is, so he'll introduce himself. There are matrilineal um, peoples, the uh, Dene. So you, you start off by referring to your mother's mother, your mother and your mother's mother. And since they were both of uh, Norwegian extent, uh, basically it's the, the, the wooden shoe people. That's how he called it, how he translates it into it. So from his major lineal line, they were the wooden shoe people. Um, so 
and, and he gives other other descriptions that are that are really really interesting. You know, it's like um, discovering lands. You know, we came in and discovered lands. He says, "Tell you what, you just leave your phones and your wallets and your computers on the table, and I'll come by and discover them for you." <laughs> So it's got a real humorous side, and he'd like to introduce that a little because it gets pretty intense. Mark does get intense, but you know, I, I look at what he's he goes through and what he works with, and uh, I would be intense <laughs> as well, just because it's so vital and so important and impactful to him. So I was just thinking of um, Phyllis's question about what he's asking the church to do, but um, you know, what I know about the truth in healing movement in ELCA is that there is one, yep. and it's being led by an indigenous person. Yep. And I don't know what's happening, how, you know, what, what the intent is, what progress they've made, how will they be communicated to those of us so the local conversations are coming congregation from somewhere. I mean, I think it's a great first step, but I hope that it doesn't happen in Chicago and say, oh, you know, check the box, we did that. And I'll give you their their intent from the start was just to start with a, a local area around Minnesota, several states, and then they were going to branch out from there. He's been basically giving seminars and lectures all year. He's tired. He's worn out. So he's taken a little bit of break just because it's a lot of, you know, it's just a lot of effort, not only effort, but just the emotional effort of talking about um, about the things that are have and do take place. Um, and somehow they're going to continue that process to expand it. So hopefully it'll get out here too. Um, I'm sure he'll be asking upon people within our our area, the Pacific Northwest, to hold those conversations as well. Because um, there, and that is the approach. There's a different approach in the indigenous communities, as far as I've learned. When you look at seven generations. You know, a lot of us, it's in the, again some of kind of a white culture kind of thing for the most part, as we look at right now or maybe a few years ahead. Um, and, and, and they're looking at seven generations ahead. How are my effects going to be lived out? And I think that's part of what we, we should or could do as well. And what are we doing right now? And how will that affect? Like we often look back at slavery and we say, oh, man, that's terrible. You know, that's right. How could we ever have done something like that? What are those things now that couple generations forward are going to look back, you know, those people in 2023, 24, what they did. And, and we should be looking at those kind of things. What are those things? And, and thinking ahead to future people and generations. So we'll keep you informed on the truth and healing process. I keep checking on their website to see what what's new out there, but it is going to be expanded into uh, uh, further areas of the United States. They have limited resources in terms of people um, to present it, so I, I'll be interested to see how they draw upon people to help uh, Vance. He's not only Indigenous, he's also Two-Spirit. I think I brought it up in a previous one. Um, so just a lot of a lot of him that's pretty unique and uh, expressionable, and we can learn from, too. Next week. I just thought I'd put a pinch in for uh, something that um, that George mentioned on uh, Thursday, January 25th. Dr. Kevin O'Brien, who teaches at PLU, uh, he's an ethicist and environmental studies professor. He's been a uh, speaker and forum here, and we've always enjoyed him. He's very personable and he's got a good sense of humor. Uh, his topic is going to be the re resisting the injustice of climate change. And the reason that we have it on in the evening, uh, I asked that question, is so that we have a little bit longer to uh, hear what he has to say and then engage in conversation. So that starts at 7, but at 6.30, the Green Team is providing some health-friendly, earth-friendly, excuse me, health and earth-friendly snacks uh, hot beverages, um, probably tea that time of the day, and uh, committee uh, with Susan Lubeck's leading all kinds of uh, 
websites on um, healthy snacks that um, make use of the bounty of the earth to celebrate. So come at 6.30 and uh, have a little bit of dessert. Uh, and then at 7, to hear Kevin O'Brien, who um, will uh, help us understand what kind of resistance is possible. How do we stay optimistic and hopeful at a time that looks, uh, can look pretty disturbing? Another announcement for next Sunday, uh, Pastor Tom will continue conversations about uh, scripture um, and uh, faith um, through the, within the Lutheran Church. And also that afternoon, the Geek Harbor for Racial Justice group, which Phyllis uh, attends their meetings regularly, they're going to host a Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, celebration at the United Methodist Church here in Geek Harbor. So if you saw there if you, if, in the weekly uh, email, um, you can click on that and, and access it. Um, and sign up. There's no fee, just donation if you'd like to come, but that'll be at the United Methodist Church. Might be Mark. Okay.